I'd like to welcome you to the second reading in the series sponsored by the Friends of the Scranton Public Library, the fourth series that we've sponsored. And once again, we have assistance from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, who would like a, a record of how many people were here and so on. So if you have not signed the piece of paper over there on the table, please do so on your way out. Also, before getting to tonight's event, I've got a couple of announcements. We try to, from time to time, keep you in touch with other poetry events in the area. The Mulberry Poets and Writers Association, once upon a time, Scanlon Saloon Poetry Series, then the Mulberry Poetry Series, would like to extend an invitation to an open reading, which is going to be at Bernie McGurl's house, and the address is 833 Monroe Avenue in Scranton. Many of you probably got this slip as you came in. 8 o'clock on Saturday, November 22nd. It's an open reading, so any of you who have any poems to read, you're welcome to do so, limited to two poems. And I believe the series is going to be trying to get going later in the winter. Also, uh, the Scranton Literary Review is on the table over there, the free copies. That's uh, an issue from last year, and they're in the process of getting going this year. But those copies are free, and if you want to get one on the way out, please pick them up then. Tonight, we have Heather McHugh to read her poetry for you. She teaches at State University of New York at Binghamton, also at Goddard College, and has taught at various other places across the country, including Stevens College and Antioch College. She's a graduate of Radcliffe, and among the honors that her, she and her poetry have received are a McDowell Colony Fellowship, a creative writing grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. She has published one book of poetry called Dangers, published by Houghton Mifflin, which will be on sale after the reading. She has another book forthcoming from, Ho from Houghton Mifflin called A World of Difference. And uh, one of the blurb writer phrases on the inside cover of this book compares her to the metaphysical poets, the 17th century English poets. Well, I suppose there are some points to be made. Their poetry is witty, uh, intellectual and sensual, but distinctly con contemporary, and I think you'll enjoy her poetry tonight. Heather McHugh. Thank you. I'm covered with dog hair, <laughs> nevertheless. You'd think by the time you had two books out, you wouldn't be covered with dog hair anymore. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> the great thing about the dogs is they don't know. You know, they still jump on you. <laughs> Ah. Um, one of the things I wanted to do tonight was to read some poems from um, some from another poet than myself, um, a guy named Jean Follin, a French poet who died in 72, and whose work for the last two years I've really been preoccupied with, partly because I've been translating um, one of his books, a book called D'Après Tout. And um, I translated the entire book. I mean, it was one of those, I was telling Carol in the restaurant tonight how I happened on Fulin. It's no great, it was no great intellectual enterprise. I was by accident in a library waiting, waiting for something other than books or book people. And I know it was, while I was waiting, I had to wait half an hour for this guy, right, so we could go somewhere else in a library. And next to me was a rack of books. And don't, you know, I do judge books by covers, you know. That's one of the reasons I turn my first book upside down all the time. But this book, you know, along its spine was no print at all. And it immediately fascinated me. And I grabbed it. It was just a red book, you know. I took it out and I looked inside. And it was all in French, a, a language which I understand reasonably well, but to which my first response is still, um, because it's not my native language, a response to graphics principally. In other words, I didn't instantly um, recognize a, the, a particular meaning. What I saw was the shape of the poem and the distribution of long and short words, and it was immediately really fascinating to me. There was something beautiful about the shape, the shapes of these poems, and I glanced through the whole book, and just leafing through that book was, like, was, a real, was for me a graphic experience. Each of the poems was very square. It was as long as it was wide. I mean, this is grossly intele intellectual enterprise, you can see, you know. It was, it, was the kind of, it was the kind of poem that just interested me because of its 
there was something about, there was a kind of equanimity from, bespoken by that for me, somehow, that distribution of fancy words and, and unfancy words, and the shape, just that plain shape of the poem. Um, I read a couple of poems then translating, and re I mean, I was, whatever I felt before was then confirmed, whatever before seemed just like magic then suddenly became very rational. It, was, it seemed like brilliant stuff to me, and I'd never read um, Folan before. It turns out there is a translation in English um, by Merwin, uh, and there's, there's also now a translation of some of his prose poems called A World Rich in Anniversaries, translated by Bill Matthews and Mary Feeney. Uh, it's put out by one of those small presses with a name that is really amazing. I mean, it's memorable because it's so amazing. It's Grilled Flowers Press. If you can get hold of that, do. Um, <laughs> Anyway, my intention in look, I mean, in, at first in looking at the work, I just loved it. And I really, I had a friend who I knew would love this stuff but didn't speak French. And, and the first impulse really was to give him the poem, to let him see what it was, uh, was so wonderful about the poem I had read. And I could only do that by translating it. And, and immediately, I mean, I'd always had a big reservation about translation. I was one of those people that said it can't be done and it's an unholy enterprise anyway and you devastate the original poem and da da da. As it turned out, um, I did it with a real feeling for fidelity, something else I'd never thought was in the reaches of my character. Um, and partly because I love the work so much and I really wanted to be able to offer to this friend as close an experience as I could in English to, to what I had had in reading the French. Um, whatever cultural bars there are to that you know, were, became secondary because of my love for the work. Um, what I did was translate the entire book um, Although that, it was not tempting to do that originally because inevitably there will be poems that do not render well in it, that are not well rendered into English or that just pose problems for, for, for you given your experience or whatever. It's much more tempting to take the poems you love from various collections. But one of the things I loved in reading this book was the way he had arranged the poems in order in the book the way one poem followed on another, or just reading the table of contents was fantastic. I mean, that's something, that's at that level I really loved the book. So um, the, the order of, I mean, for example, there was a series of three poems, um, all of which it became clear, even right from the titles, were dealing with some kind of circle. Um, one, one was called um, Wonders of the Circle. One was called Hoops, about those hoops that children play with in the roads. Um, and one was about a wheelwright a guy who made wheels. And, and I mean, that kind of collecting of poems within the collection became of great interest to me. And, and all in all, my work with Folin is, is largely responsible for, for what are pretty dramatic changes between my first book and my second book. Um, in particular, I think in the first book, um, which I'll sell you real cheap because I'm going to disparage it now. <laughs> um, in the first book, I remember, I mean, there was even a line from one of the poems in the first book where I said, it isn't what but how. I had been writing uh, what was called by my parents poetry since I was five. I mean, I now understand that to have been a maldefinition. Um, but there were versy little things about, you know, they rhymed and, and they, were, they, were about, they were about clean engineers and things like that. I mean, I remember my mother saved all these things as mothers will. And I read one recently and it said something like, engineer green is so neat to be seen. You know, and if you had a slovenly child, probably you'd want to celebrate that impulse too. You know, it didn't. I, still, it didn't help ultimately. But, but you know, when I look back at those things now, I'm sort of horrified. But anyway, I was indulged for that. I was praised for it, and I continued to to just write these little sort of jingles almost. I would. I was great material for McDonald's in a way. And finally, that's what someone told me. You know, that that's what dawned on me that I had this sort of facility. I was proud, I was really proud by the time I was in high school that you could give me any proposition and put me in a room for 15 minutes and I could make a really winning poem, poem out of it, you know? That horrifies me now, but then I was proud, it was a matter of pride to me. And so as a result, you know, in this book I could write, um, I was really proud, for example, too, that in the poems were these buried formalities that most readers wouldn't catch, you know, that I could later be my own best critic and, and expose the, the critical complexities of the poem. Um, I now see that as a kind of um, evil intent with respect to the reader. I mean, that there's some real problem in that. And it's, about, it's all about 
it all remains at the level of craftiness in a way. And now, if I had to choose a what over a how, and I find it now very difficult to disengage one from the other, I would have to go the other way. I mean, now I really care about the what more than the how. Almost the how is secondary. I mean, it, it, insofar, again, as they're separable. But a lot of this has to do with Fallin. You'll see from these poems that um, he's not a stylist in the sense of, I mean, as, as some people, and that's what I was brought up on. I was brought up on Wallace Stevens and Berryman and, and I mean, even, I mean, I would put Cummings in that and Gertrude Stein and I love those people where the texture of the language was primary. And, and then to read Fallin was an astonishment to me because I loved him and yet the language was utterly plain. There almost never was a fancy word in there. I mean, that just at that level, um, it was plain. For, um, in a way, what, what, is, I mean, what happens is that you experience the poem, there are no abstractions almost in the poems, and yet you experience them as highly intellectual poems. I mean, you, you, there is a wisdom here, but it is not of abstraction, and that's something else I did not natively, I think, even understand or believe. Um, so it was a real revelation for me. Anyway, I'll get on. The first poem I'm going to read uh, seems to disprove my contention that he, he never uses fancy words, because it's called hecatum. Um, a word which in English, as in French, is obscure, an obscure word um, meaning a massive slaughter. I think it comes from a thousand oxen. But you'll see in the context of the poem how, ex I mean, first of all, I should tell you that it's a very extraordinary thing that he would use such a word. And then you recognize in the context of the poem how he uses it, who uses it, and how that character is ironically manipulated in the course of the poem so that it becomes a comment on the use of that word. Hecatum. The sky stays intense blue as several men drop dead. The old thinker who doesn't want to change the language can find for such a fact but one word, hecatum. The villagers who survive in full light of day begin soberly to eat and drink. Now, I mean, in Fallin, there's always, because the abstraction is never appended to the poem, it's, you know, how you read it is, is a matter for some dispute, perhaps. But, I mean, in here you get the sense of those two, those two sets of characters being set up in contrast, the old intellectual and the villagers, and, and the old intellectual who, in the face of this death, I mean, that nature remains impassive anyway. The sky stays intense blue as several men drop dead. The old intellectual, the old thinker, who doesn't want to change the language, no matter what happens, can find for such a fact but one word, hecatum. The villagers who survive, that's an interesting little phrase. I mean, in there, almost, in those two words, is almost the whole cut of the poem. The villagers who survive in full light of day begin soberly to eat and drink and soberly to eat and drink. I mean, not to forget, but to survive. Now that, I mean, I love the way in which that becomes an intellectual poem, and yet refrains from making grand um, pronouncements. I also, I mean, I love when in that context of a plain speaking poetry you get a fancy word like that, partly because I'm addicted to, to dictionaries of strange words. I'm addicted to words anyway. That's sort of, that's partly where I started. A friend of mine gave me a book, um, which is a dictionary of difficult terms, in which I found this, this, this incredible set of words in the English language for things you would never think you had to have a word for. Like, there's, there's a word for sheep's perspiration <laughs> that, that gets dried into the wool, and it's called swint. It's great, you know? I mean, it's a wonderful word. Can, you know, I have swint in my sweater. Can you imagine? I mean, the possibilities, just, it's perfect. There, a lot of them are great for devising new insults and things. I mean, I, I think I had heard, I think I had heard sesquipedalian, and that's not the stuff of insults, really. I mean, but there, there were two words I discovered in the same por portion of the dictionary. The S's were really great. There was sesquipedalian and semilincident. And sesquipedalian means a foot and a half long, which is nice, you know, like the, those hot dogs at Coney Island or, you know. I mean, there, there are only a few contexts in which I can imagine something to which I would refer that way. Probably, you know, probably usually that would be a, a, a compliment, I think. But, but semal incident is, is a word that means occurring only once in the same person. 
You know, I mean, this is strange. I mean, if you said to someone that, you know, you could wish on someone a sesquipedalian hard on, which would be nice. <laughs> But you, I mean, maybe, depending. <laughs> or, but a semel incident hard on. I mean, you know, it's, they may not even know the difference, but to wish that on them is really sort of a terrible thing, you know? Or just words like necropolis, which you can figure out, but that, that should mean a large cemetery is sort of wonderful, you know, necropolis, you know, to wish that on someone. There are words like there's a word, um, um, Terratism means love of monsters. There's a root for monster in that. That's wonderful. I mean, which could just be a way of talking about parental love or something, you know, in, in some households. It's just, but it's a great, a great new word for it, you know. I love those things. There's a word, oh yeah, there's one, a rhetorical device that I'd never heard of before. I mean, it's the list of tropes in any case is sort of incredible. But this is one that I think presidential candidates must have, must have studied or something. It's called aporia, and it means the rhetorical device of pretending not to know what to do or say. <laughs> what a great level of calculation that is, you know? Anyway, um, there's the, the second poem by Follin I want to read is called Not Everything is Spoken. A great thing for a poet to entitle a poem, I think. In this virgin place, animals go from evening to morning without thought. The trees tremble, the reflecting pool stagnates, deserts pursue their mirages. Those of the human race go by. Not everything is spoken, shouts the most beautiful woman. In this virgin place, animals go from evening to morning without thought. Unlike us. The trees tremble, the reflecting pool stagnates, deserts pursue their mirages, those of the human race go by. What a proportion that, I mean, you know, in this sort of Eden-esque construct we're getting, only in the third line from the end do we get those of the human race go by. Just like, I mean, that, that vantage point on history appeals to me enormously right away. And the, those of the human race go by. Not everything is spoken, shouts the most beautiful woman. Something I wish I could say. I drive to all these readings, you know, I'm co like constantly picking up hitchhikers, and I want to tell you the worst hitchhikers are intellectuals, are the ones, you know, who just learned about Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and want to tell you, you know. There's something I want to say, not everything is spoken, you know, or, or put a sign in my windshield that say, says, pedants must walk, or something, you know. <laughs> Let me drive in peace. Force of Circumstance. This poem um, comes from, it, the, the title of the poem comes from a, an expression in French which is force des choses. And it means literally the power of things, too. So that there's an element of that there that I, you know, I didn't translate. But the colloquial intent is force of circumstance. Thinking you hear knocking, you take the lamp, open the door to find nothing but wind. It's not the old cripple, not the frightened beast which trembling and brushing past nevertheless likes being alive. All the windows are closed tight. Many deny the memory, but forgetfulness is never complete. What's outside there? So light. This is. This, this, you'll notice all the references to vision in this one. I have, I have a certain weakness for that to my four eyes. So light. The eyelets of the corsets cast their reflections. Closed Venetian blinds protect a world the illusion of which will fall away. The hour has the flavor of its time. So light the lamps, someone says. See here, it's night. The eyelids of the corset. It's great that they're foreclosing. You know, this is, I mean, it's a portrait of an era that really amounts to an indictment of its blindness in a way. But it's all done through little references to vision, like the eyelids of the corset cast their reflections. Closed Venetian blinds. In French, the word for Venetian blinds is pelzienne, which looks like the 
feminine form of Persian. I mean, it looks like Persian women, too, in a sense. So the clothes, these closed Persian women almost is a it's, a, it's a resonance of the French. You know, you wouldn't read it literally that way, but it's a resonance you can't exactly translate. Closed Venetian blinds protect a world, the illusion of which will fall away. The hour has the flavor of its time. So light the lamps, someone says. See here, it's night. Um, actually, I'll just read two more full lamp poems. One is, this one is called Solitary Inkwell, a real gush of a title, you know, but it's f totally forgiven because of the first line. And I read it partly as an, as an account of the act of poetry itself because of that particular nomenclature, Solitary Inkwell. There is a mushroom called Solitary Inkwell, also black egg. It stands with no others about it. White animals come close. The hedge appears to be on fire. The heart of a woman who passes by beats hard within her. She is seeing so far off again the ocean waves. She crosses the narrow bridge. And then the houses of the outskirts come carrying rays of light. I sort of love that one as, when I can read it as, as, a, as a, a poem about the act of poetry because it moves from that solitude in the forest back to the human community. There's a real, there's something lovely in a poet putting, putting, the direction, put, putting that direction, that construction on it. Um, this last one of Folau read is called Deep Down. These all come, the book, the translation of the title in English is, um, according to everything, modestly enough. Um, and it's going to be available from Princeton sometime in 1981. I'm not sure when. It'll probably be late, because they're still negotiating with Gallimard. Deep down, this one's called. Without making any big step, a man thinks, deep down, maybe I am happy. A, a bird nearby flutters without singing, darkness coming on. The woman quiets down but talks in her sleep. Over the tawny expanse, branches rustle, footsteps reverberate. The knife thrown in anger rusts by a beech tree. When will wars be over? A passerby asks, wispy with white hair. For a long time, no one answers. Um, now these, all the poems, I guess, that I'll read tonight, all the rest of the ones I'll read tonight are from the new collection, A World of Difference, um, partly because I can give you copies of Dangers and you can read them for yourselves and this, this won't be available for a couple months, and partly because they're still strange to me. <laughs> um, the, this is called The Field. It, you'll recognize in it um, evidence of my having lived in academia a little, a little long, perhaps. The field, I mean, I can't even say the field without thinking field of specialty, you know, it's that bad. <laughs> it was my day to study in the field. I found fences strung with glass beads, small possessions of shock, the farms of his and hers. I couldn't make myself at home. I lowed so the cow would, but the cow looked up misquoted. When I got back to the house, my five hired fellow specialists were taping their abstracts to the window. Soon it would be dark. That, I forget sometimes to say that those fences strung with glass beads where I grew up are the ones you're not, you shouldn't touch. They're the shocking ones. But it, they make them, it's so perverse, they make them so that l the little primitives that children are want them, you know, they look like necklaces, they got these beads and they're just the ones you most want to touch, you know, the most want to fool around with. The house. In evening purples, the kings draw farther and farther away as absolute and cool as stars. 
Dark brings its sexual power to bear until the trees outside are huge. Help, I tell the deaf man. Look, I signal to the man with broken eyes. The moon is in its seventh month. A truck goes by with singing in its wake and outside chants. I've got to leave this house where my uncle who has lost his hands, my father who has lost his tongue, decide that everything is relative. They cannot mean the world to me, turning to themselves, taking the window for bad art. That's, I have this, I have this intuition that something about the way you make buildings decides what you think the world is. Like, you know, at Howard Johnson's, like you stay in a motor inn at Howard Johnson's, you almost can't tell the way they fix whatever's outside your window even there they fix, you know, where the swimming pool is and everything. It's the same orange and blue as inside, and the pictures are orange and blue, and the windows are orange and blue, and the world suddenly looks like that, you know, like there's a little hojo impress on, the, on its right-hand corner. Um, in this, you see some of that in this one about the child in the house and things, the house taking, the world, as long as you're in the house, taking that shape. Um, also, I'm sort of boggled still by dimensions. I mean, I remember really vividly when I was a kid having sort of waking not nightmares or waking dreams about dimension, about proportion, about like that one of my fingers would get enormous or be bigger than the room or, you know, some, I don't I almost can't explain it anymore. It was a really odd feeling I had that, that I, I was, I could be huge and it was amazing that the whole room didn't tip that way or I didn't contain it or something. And I think now I attribute a lot of that to the fact that when you're a kid, you grow, that it's really odd. It seems odd almost to me now that I've been this height for a while, you know, that what it must mean about your sense of the flexibility or undependability or strangeness of the world that, I mean, you know how it feels when you go back to where you were when you were that size, if you haven't seen it in a long time, how diminutive it seems now and how enormous it was then. And the sense of scale just still boggles me. In the morning, it all, you'll also recognize, I'm sorry, I talk too much. I know, but I won't have to do this. Um, you'll also recognize in this a real preoccupation I have right now with the news. You know, that's the window on the world, too, and it's the shape of the house. It's, I mean, whatever the, how, the news organ is shapes somehow what the world is for you. And I mean, it's great. It seems great to me in a lot of ways. I don't know yet what, I, what it's all about, but there's something about the fact that the word for novels and the word for news are, are almost the same. I mean, that, that interests me a lot, that, that it is some kind of fiction, and I should be aware of that. And it interests me a lot that Walter Cronkite was the most electable person in the country, you know? I mean, that he was the one everybody trusted most in, in polls that, that, quest, that asked that question. And why? Because he reads. Because <laughs> he can read, right? He's, for 20 years, he could read. <laughs> That's, it's, not a bad, it's not a bad basis, you know? But, you know, it, all, it interests me, the news what it means in the morning. Our youngest put his blue shoes on. He spent a long time lacing them. His fingers still felt new. He walked through the house as we slept. The dust was deep. We kept on dreaming up a past that we could keep him in. When he opened the door, the light fell into the house in the shape of a house. He entered a yard of sizeless sun and nations of shimmering ants and bees. It might have been a year or a star away for all we knew when the missiles came. Our child is watching his step. The blue is in his eyes. The missiles come to prove the inconceivable can be delivered. And two enormous stati statisticians smile in the close-up shot in the soundproof room. Terrible to mispronounce statisticians right in the third from the last line. You know? Mind. I had a lot of education. I got a lot of fervent ideas about education once I was on this end of it. <laughs> um, I think I had them before, but now I get to say them. That's, that's the great thing about growing up. Um, 
I mean, you grow up believing that expertise is outside of you, is elsewhere, that, that in a way, that's the gist of education. I mean, why higher education is about specialty, why it's about specialists. And, and there's a, for me, there's a sort of fundamental problem in that in terms of what I think brightness is or what I think knowledge is. And, and that, you know, that we trust calculators and read out so much more than our own senses. And that when someone says, you know, like when the, the person you live with says, why don't you see what the weather is? They mean turn on the radio, you know? turn on the TV and find out what the weather is. That, that always seems, boggles me in a certain way. Um, and that the worst snow is when the reception is bad, right? When, when the snow on the television is the worst snow. That's, that's the one that can wreck your life. You know? um, I've had the experience of, of, the most unromantic experience of approaching somebody, of, of wanting to make love with somebody, someone and having them say, I got to check the TV guide, you know? I mean, that's having reference to this out. Do you want to make love? Let me check the TV guide. There's some strange reference in that. And if real people is on, they become a statue. You know, <laughs> it's really amazing. Or Saturday Night Live is on. You know, suddenly there's rigor mortis in the bedroom. It's really amazing. Anyway, this poem you can see in the first line of this poem that it comes from that and about the education that can make a child grow up to do that. Mind. A man looks at his watch to see if he's hungry. Yes, it's eight. He can imagine the white fish, white pepper, creme de la creme, what his wife has made. He says, you shouldn't have. She says, don't mention it. The sun grows thin. At dinner, the child tells a story. What he saw outside, red hair, a burning tree, a word on a sidewalk. Mind your language, someone says. He bites his tongue. At school, his days are numbered. He makes a felt calendar, but that's not the idea. Color is a frequency and not the object. Now do you see? Soon he'll be old enough to take criticism, practice saying, so and so sounds deaf, so and so looks yeah, blind. Okay, we definitely thank you. Outside, right the fire day. trucks leave the scene, a safe gray street. Yeah, okay. Somebody told me once the mind isn't gray, no matter what we like to think about it, or in it, <laughs> or of it. It's about an in and of, about and of, and after. This starts me. The only thing they ever made me memorize when I was a kid in school was prepositions. What good does that do me now? As soon as I say about, I go about, above, across, after, against, among, around, out, before, behind, beside, between, by, down, during, except for, from, in, near, of, off, on, over, through, to, toward, under, up, with. So? <laughs> Equipped for life. <laughs> That and under the spreading chestnut tree, <laughs> the village smithy stands. All this stuff about what men are, you know, that the smith, a mighty man is he, with strong and sinewy hands. <laughs> like. A poem called Like. Always I have to resist the language I have to love. This is my work. As the girl reflected in the cow pond studies frequencies of throb, the meaning isn't deep.